Rehum was an American institution now. They were known coast to coast. They had people riding the buses. Definitely that Matt Robinson's marketing schemes paid off and paid off in spades. Wickman, Caesar, and Bogan let the railroads in. For instance, this old shot here, you can see the Pennsylvania Railroad logo right on the door. Many of the uh, old Greyhound operating divisions, Pennsylvania Greyhound, Central Greyhound, which is New York Central Railroad, uh, Great Northern Railroad, Northland Greyhound, Southern Pacific Railroad, Southland Greyhound, Southeastern uh, Cotton Belt Railroad, Richmond Fredericksburg, Potomac, Richmond Greyhounds. The railroads, like we said, built America's inner city bus industry, including the mighty Greyhound Corporation. Brand new terminals everywhere. Right downtown, that was 34th Street in New York City. Deals were struck, some that didn't pan out too much, like, again, trying to mate with the fledgling airlines that looked like they were on their way. One of the best coups they ever pulled was getting associated with the World's, World's Fair uh, organizations. Chicago World's Fair, they supplied exclusively the transportation, having White Motors build them some special, unique tractor-trailer buses. The old wills were converted into moving vans, and a, a vast national network of uh, moving vans uh, entered the scene. Here you could buy a franchise. Say you had a van company in, in Paducah. Well, you could get a Greyhound franchise and carry the Greyhound van sign on your, uh, on your truck. We had one down in Bridgeport that was a few blocks from my house, and that was a Greyhound van operation. Here's a regal old girl of the times. With a sleeper cab yet. That would be sold off in the 70s to the Smith people in Canada, or Smythe as they prefer to be called. Greyhound went on all out campaign. They even created the first, for all practical purposes, in-flight magazine, The Highway Traveler, which is a much sought after collector, uh, collectible now. Magazines of the Times, they advertised heavily in those. Collier's Look, Sad Evening Post. Little Fitzjohn was plopping along with their little body works. Little Flexible was going along. Yellow Coach was getting massive. ACF Grill wasn't doing too bad. Streetcars were doing bad though. Buses were knocking streetcar systems out left and right, coast to coast. Well-established systems, dependable systems began to emerge, like the Blue Way, which operated from New England into New York. These are, well, this is an old ACF, regal little girl, but she had a big sister and even a bigger brother, and that was the P-64, probably one of the prettiest engine forward inner city buses ever built, the P-64, 33 passenger, Little tiny bits of streamlining uh, evident here. Isn't that a pretty rear end? Of course, that was styled after the, the Pullman observation cars at the time. Now, the big sister, the P64, the big brother, the P64B, that was a 41 passenger bus. And I know some old timers who worked for Blue Way and drove those, and they said that, that that ACF machine was a magnificent vehicle. It was a powerful vehicle. Of course, it had Hall Scott gas engines in it. The P64B, you can tell by the three marker lights and the extra passenger window, of course, uh, over the P64. 
See the mark lights over the rear window? Look at that rear end. Isn't that gorgeous? And that big drum head there in the middle glowed very, very light blue at night. It was really pretty. They had a big sign up on the top of the, the bus. Leaders, not followers, uh, Blue Way did. Uh, they were going to do it. They were going to go it alone. Everybody was joining the short way, the Great Eastern System, uh, or Greyhound, and uh, these guys. They were going to tough it out by themselves. They would change that. They would change that very soon. Buses were pretty back then. Lots of character. It's an old Mac BK here. Mac dabbled lightly, as we said, in the intercity, but they were going more and more as the 30s closed into transit exclusively. Then it hit the blockbuster. White Motors brought out their 54A Streamliner. Oh boy, even Greyhound bought it. GM had to immediately revamp the production line and start streamlining their buses. It, it really impacted. It impacted the industry. They did not like the idea that Greyhound, a yellow coach didn't like the idea Greyhound was buying this. A beautiful interior. Oh, gracious, the interior with the goose down headrests and whatnot. It was, in the bus fan's eyes, the epitome of engine forwards for the most part. However, as pretty as it was, it was created by the Bender Body Company. Bender Body was very closely allied with White. It was, it was still uh, a little less durable and a little more expensive to operate than the yellow coaches. As one old fellow said, you almost didn't need a garage with a yellow coach. They were so dependable, the quality was so high. So, Mac, as we said, they streamlined, they took away from their little bulldog look here, when the, which they had copied Twin Coach in their look, and Mac streamlined their, their transit line in the mid-30s. The Macs uh, were doing very, very, very well as transit buses. As we said, they backed off the inner city market and left that to ACF. Uh, even Twin Coach backed away from it. They left that to ACF and, and, and GM to fight out for the most part, Yellow Coach. The Macs were pretty back then. A little flexible had to streamline. They were doing fairly well. This was one of their larger coaches. They're primarily in the, in the mid 30s, the flexibles all look subtle like this here. It's a California operation. Another picture by bus historian Bob Burroughs. His Orange Belt Stages, which is still alive and well uh, today with the Haywood family operates uh, line service in California. But that's one of their early flexibles. But as we said, flexible did streamline. And this is what the, the mid-30s flexible looked like here. Pretty little thing. Flexible was having a terrible time with the engine heating. They would solve that problem very shortly, though. Here's another 37, 38 flexible, which they called the tri-bumper. Twin coach streamlined. This was one of the last inner city cars they would make right here for Penn, Ohio. They went over instead to concentrate, as we said, heavily in, in transit. And this is a surface transportation in New York, one of their big twins. Now even their big twins, you could look right in the window from shoulder height. On the west coast, Kenworth opted to stay with the engine forward. After all, they were truck builders, but they did streamline the deck and a half. Little Fitz John, well, they had to round out their product too. They got away from the engine forward. There's an engine forward, Darringer Greyhound Fitz John. Darringer Greyhound is 
One of those odd operations that existed down through the years. There have been many, many of them. The Fitzjohn plant was doing well, but primarily, uh, one of their biggest sellers, not the primary, but one of their biggest sellers was the stretch out Chevrolet sedan. They were doing very well with that with the smaller operators. One, of course, as you know, is, is alive and well today at Capital Bus. Uh, Dick McGuire, rather. He's sold Capital Bus since. But the Fitzjohn sedan bus for 36, oh, yes, yes. That was a good seller. There's no question to that. Beck, oh, well. Here it is, the streamliner. Beck had their streamliner. They got away from the engine forward here, although in 36, they did offer you, you, you your choice. You could have an engine forward or a little streamliner. Of course. Yellow Coach, oh, they brought out a big streamliner. They were panic struck over that white 54A's success, and this was their answer. They even went after their little old transit division. This is a beautiful yellow 740 of Baltimore. The little ones, now they, they built a small car. The 712 shown here to combat the, the sale of Fitzjohn, Beck, and Flexible and the likes of that. Actually, way back in 1933, they brought out this, which was the Model 711. And she would grow into many variants, including my all-time favorite, the 740. Now, here's some for the Lynn Division of the Eastern Mass, although I never saw them. I don't know where the Eastern Mass got them to, but uh, I love the, the 700 series uh, GM transit buses. The first hydraulic, or what you would call automatic transmissions, transmissions blah, 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 were introduced uh, with the 700 series buses too. But the big seller, which would again come and it would eventually pummel the, uh, the white 54A streamliner was that 843 right there. Now 36, the yellow coach line was major, it was extensive, the 733 for the smaller light operators. Several variants of the 700 series, all the way up to uh, 731s and 740s. One of the most unique, of course, buses that ever existed is the all-service vehicle, shown here for public service in New Jersey. This bus could operate off trolley wires or run on its own engine because it turned a traction motor. Well, the diesel was starting to appear, too. People were leery of this at first. But in 36, the diesel was being played with by a yellow coach. 722. This was a nice little inner city car for the time period. Nice variant still kicking around at peerless stages today. And of course, the big gun, as we said, the 843, which was the epitome and of the uh, yellow coach line as far as engine forwards go. It would be the last engine forward. It came. Yellow Coach honored their commitment. Greyhound had an exclusive bus. Hand built by Dwight Austin. So, finally. However, it wasn't arrived at easily. There were a whole host of ideas being kicked around by uh, Dwight Austin's design team, the Greyhound engineers, and the Yellow Coach folks. Yellow Coach decided, I guess we'd better, we'd better give them their exclusive bus. I mean, they were out there buying whites. Mercy me, we can't have that. 
Well, anyhow, here's what emerged. The X1. The first bus with a rear engine and transverse drive. First bus with underfloor baggage bays that were airtight, that were actually practical. It was gasoline, of course. But the X1, as it all test beds, underwent many modifications. I love that old Art Deco bumper there. Isn't that thing gorgeous? The destination sign underneath. Now, Greyhound said, no, that, that wasn't too hot. A car could block that. Uh, you got to remember, cars were, were tall in those days. They said, nah, we didn't like that. And they also said, you know, this, this is the Art Deco period. This is obviously an Art Deco bus, really beautiful. We need a little different paint scheme, too. She underwent her tilt test. Back in those days, all buses underwent tilt tests to see where they would fall over. What angle of degree they could go on a, on a road that was canted and whatnot. But the X2 came from the X1. All they did was rework X1. And uh, rework it, uh, they did too. New destination sign that was put up top. Eventually the marker lights would be changed. A whole bunch of things. She was slated for Pennsylvania Greyhound Lines and so they stuck their logo on there in a hurry. They knew this bus would be getting a lot of publicity. Here she is, 001. The first yellow coach 719. 329 719s would be born. This was shot at the old Fox and Hounds out there by Birmingham, Michigan, which is the last time I knew still in existence. It's a, it's a restaurant. She had a solid cast front end. Some of the first ones went to Pacific Greyhound, and Bob Burroughs, again, we're grateful to for these pictures. Pacific Greyhound lettered all of their coaches back in those days. This one was the city of Monterey. Now the 719 up by the destination sign had vertical lines going up and down by the air intakes. Here's the city of Bakersfield. Little different teardrop headlight. And of course uh, the rear was uh, the three-piece windshield and a different air intake grill. Now that's the 719. However, this coach had some weight problems, uh, particularly with that cast front end. Uh, they, they weren't too terribly happy over if you ever got whacked with that. So they redesigned it again, and this car would emerge as the 743. See those vertical? There's an, there's an easy way to tell a 719 from 43, other than looking at the rear end. There's those vertical lines up there at the air intakes. Little different tear light, teardrop headlight. Now, the 743 would have a, a completely different rear end, as you will see. Now, this was the 719 rear end. Little Art Deco with the drum head in the center. That was the breather, and the three piece rear windows in the back. Other than that, she would look amazingly like her, her big sister, uh, the 743. The interior was exquisite. For the times, it was dynamite. It had a million little holes in the ceiling for draft-free ventilation. Of course, as we said, the, the baggage bays. These would also get revamped in the 743 series. There was even a 745. Uh, a deluxe Pullman car, actually all it was, was a re rework 719. She was a sleeper and went to Pacific Greyhound Lines for trials running between Kansas City and the coast on that line they had there with the Columbia Night Coaches as well. However, she would eventually be sent over to Ohio Greyhound Lines to run the limited service. And the limited service was uh, a very, very successful service running primarily out of Cleveland down to, through the south. Uh, here she is. Here's Baby. 
Now, at the same time this bus was born, so was I. Now, they tell me that I was on this uh, 12 days after I was born, because I don't remember that. But in the summer of uh, 44, when the old man lost his job again, the old man was uh, low income and uneducated and was always losing his job. We'd have to go to New York to live with Grandma. That thing came out of the fog at me. See the entire different, completely different rear end than the 719. Uh, it was a real rainy, foggy night, and that thing came out of the fog at me, and bingo, I was in love. I knew that for the rest of my life, first air conditioning was introduced here, too. They started out life as gasoline, but they ended up as diesel. The 743, uh, there was a substantial number built. As a matter of fact, let's see, where are my little records here? There were 1,256 of them built between 1937 and 1939. They got involved again with the New York World's Fair as well as the one in California. Had a special uh, Art Deco decal made for the the side of the bus I, I I ran into some coaches later on in years that that didn't get rubbed off entirely and uh, I managed to see that it was a very beautiful decal again there's that beautiful interior for the t state of the time and uh, with her lights on too mohair seats are very very rugged things on sunburns but here's some actual New England Greyhound Line cars at uh, Goodall's uh, restaurant post house up in uh, North Oxford, Massachusetts. My, my favorite place was the, uh, the Greens Farms Westport Station. Well, the Battle of Britain was raging, and uh, the initial Art Deco paint scheme didn't work out too terribly well. Uh, that big teardrop along the side was a decal. It was not painted. So when the buses were repainted, they honored the Biggin Hill Squadron of the Royal Air Force by carrying the RAF Squadron insignia on the side of the bus and putting the Greyhound dog over it. So this is commonly referred to as the Battle of Britain paint job, and it's my all-time favorite. The two bars were gold. The outside roundel was red and the inside was blue, which is what the RAF uh, carries. Oh, when I saw this for the first time, whoo, I did cartwheels. I thought, ooh, wow, is that thing pretty. The varying stripes in the front, uh, they, 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 were, they were sort of optional. They, they bounced around the countryside from Greyhound to Greyhound. There's Great Lakes Greyhound here. Some were wide, some were, were narrow, so that was sort of like to the divisional Greyhound operations, how that ended up. As a matter of fact, Pacific uh, Greyhound lines in California. Here's uh, here's another Bob Burrow shot, which theirs was entirely different. So that uh, back in those days, naturally, was the option of the the carrier. Tesh Greyhound didn't have any of the decals, and just plain old fashioned uh, the the side and put the the big Greyhound dog on the side without the decal. Uh, the, the RAF roundel. We had several of these up my way too, but most of them uh, fortunately carried the RAF paint job. Here's oval and greyhound lines. Again, just the straight paint scheme with two little gold bars running over the nose. But this was it. This, this bus impacted the industry. Dear God in heaven, didn't everybody sat up and take notice. Copies? Everybody copied it. Up in Canada, it was copied by the Fort Gary Body Works. Here's what their idea of a 743 was, but uh, they still had an engine in the front of the bus. You can, it was uh, mounted on a truck chassis. You can see the radiator breather up there. Tons and tons and tons of manufacturers just decided, oh mercy, that thing is so beautiful. And. Fort Gary, of course, would uh, evolve into MCI eventually. Now, as we said, it was an exclusive Greyhound bus. You could not buy it without the permission of Greyhound. Because Greyhound had a lot of friends in those days. Uh, Crown Coach, Indian Trails, a whole host of people. Union Pacific Stages, 
They were allowed to buy the 743. Champlain coach lines, Frontier coach lines, and Gray Line out of New York City uh, were all owned by the Fifth Avenue Corporation. And they were allowed to buy them because they were very closely allied with Greyhound. These are perhaps the, the, the more beautiful uh, schemes of the, of the 30s. They were red. What would be dark, they would be red. And what would be gray would be gray with gold striping. Beautiful coaches. Uh, Frontier would be sold to Vermont. Champlain would be sold to Greyhound. And the gray line, line out of New York to Atlantic City would be sold to public service. Now, as I said, I was just a young one here, boy, a real, real little fella. And uh, I was coming on, starting to learn about my buses. Here's a gray coach in Canada. They were allowed to have them. I understand that was an exquisitely beautiful blue and gray and, and cream paint job. Uh, provincial uh, bus lines up in Canada, they also were allowed to have the 743. Theirs were traction orange and black. Uh, a very brilliant looking uh, 743. Eastern Michigan Motor Bus, which was just on the verge of becoming Great Lakes Greyhound, uh, got them, as we said, Union Pacific. And one of the oddest operations uh, that ever ran uh, the exclusive Greyhound 743 was Burlington Trailways. Here, see, Crown used theirs on, on through lines in conjunction with Greyhound. Crown Coach would last for quite a few years. They would, they would carry But as we said, the bus was copied. Imitation is the best form of flattery, the most sincere form of flattery. Here's, here's uh, Pacific Coach and uh, Foundry up in the, in the Pacific Northwest. They copied it. They liked the paint scheme, too.